Chinchilla Reservation had been created to end the Cayuse War, the territory of Washington had been around two full years. The territory was run by Governor Isaac Stevens. This guy was brutal to Native Americans within the territory's borders. In an attempt to establish U.S. political dominance with the new Washington Territory, Governor Stevens made it a point to reach out to all major Native American tribes in his borders and enforce the sovereignty of the U.S. Territory over the tribes. To do this, he brokered and sometimes forced or threatened tribes into treaties where natives would give up all of their land in return for reservations, right to fisheries, land that couldn't be settled by whites, and agencies where payments and provisions would be paid to the tribes. In season two of Two Wheels, One Compass, we saw how the Minnesotan government did the same thing to the Dakota tribe and it did not turn out well. The worst part about Governor Stevens' treaties is that they were very hard to enforce. Washington State was very far from Washington, D.C. Communication to vote or ratify treaties was slow, and actually setting up agencies to dole out provisions and payments to the natives was even slower. Many promises he made were difficult or even impossible to keep. One such example was the case of the Yakima native tribes in the center of the territory. Right after the Cayuse War ended in 1855, Governor Stevens made an agreement for the Yakima tribe to cede some six million acres in exchange for $200,000 and a reservation where no white man could settle nor enter. The issue with this was Stevens couldn't enforce this agreement and it had to be ratified in Washington, D.C. Stevens was actually in Washington, D.C. trying to get the Senate to ratify the treaty when tensions in his territory came to a boiling point. Just as it was in the Great Sioux War, gold was discovered bringing prospectors to the Yakima tribal territory where the proverbial fuse was lit on the powder keg. Two white prospectors raped a Yakima woman on the reservation, leading tribal leaders Kamiakin's nephew to murder them in return. A Bureau of Indian Affairs agent, Andrew Bolton, departed on horseback to investigate the murders of the prospectors. Upon reaching the reservation, Yakima natives told Bolton it was not safe and he should be escorted out. Before leaving, a fight broke out between the Yakima escorts over the fate of Bolton and he ended up being stabbed to death. In an effort to end the escalating violence, the Yakima sent a messenger to Fort Dalles, formerly Fort Lee, to tell them who had committed the murders so that they may stand trial for the murder and end all hostilities. Once the word was sent, however, panic ensued across the territories that an uprising was in progress. The same news spread across the native tribes of the region, emboldening them and rallying them under one leader, Kamiakin. The Oregon and Washington territories mustered troops and the tribes under Kamiakin rallied for battle. This led to the Yakima War. Major Granville O. Holler, an 84 infantry, set out from Fort Dalles into Yakima territory and was met by some 300 Yakima warriors. The first engagement of the Yakima War was the Battle of Toppenish Creek, which was a huge loss for the U.S. military. They were forced to retreat, resulting in a Yakima victory. The territorial governments panicked and mustered forces that crossed from Fort Dalles into the Washington territory. They would eventually take on the Yakima under Kamiakin head on. To the northwest, another war was brewing. Leshai, an Esqually chief who was half Yakima, was going around to the native tribes of the Puget Sound area, recruiting warriors to bring battle to the doorstep of the territorial government. Governor Isaac Stevens had also pushed the Nisqually into a treaty. It gave them fishing rights, but took away all of their farmland. 2.24 million acres were taken, and the Nisqually were put onto useless, rough, and rocky reservations that were basically land that whites didn't want. Leshai was the chief who was in charge of negotiating for the natives in the Puget Sound area. After hearing of the Yakima uprising at the Battle of Toppenish Creek, he recruited some 150 warriors of neighboring tribes. In response, a small regiment of 18 volunteer dragoons were mustered to arrest Leshai. The dragoons were discovered on the White River. Leshai and his warriors attacked them, pushing the dragoons to hide in a cabin for defensive cover for four days before they could escape. Leshai's warriors then raided several settlers' cabins along the White River and they killed nine civilians. The civilians had been told by neutral natives to flee, but they didn't leave. Until his death, Leshai claimed that he did everything he could to stop the massacre along the White River. While this was going on, 243 U.S. soldiers were attempting to cross the Nashes Pass and enter the Yakima homeland from the rear. The snow was too thick and they'd gone around and attempted to cross at the White River. Leshai's forces were spotted and the U.S. made an attempt to cross. They were unable to advance due to native sharpshooters and they waited until the next day to make another attempt. Leshai's warriors fell back to the Green River and celebrated only to be attacked again by U.S. soldiers. The attack was unsuccessful and there were only casualties on the U.S. side. The soldiers ended up falling back, marking a victory for Leshai at the Battle of White River. Days later, 
the force that had been mustered by both Oregon and Washington's territorial governments attacked a defensive barrier put up by Kamiakin with artillery. For the next few days, the U.S. would advance on Kamiakin only to be attacked by natives using hit-and-run tactics, using geographical barriers such as forests and rivers the whole way. This tired and angered the soldiers who were gaining casualties left and right. These failed series of attacks were called the Battle of Union Gap. Only one of Kamiakin's soldiers died during the attacks. Frustrated with winter approaching, the U.S. forces returned to Fort Dalles. Later in the month of November, U.S. soldiers returned to the White River Valley where the Battle of White River had occurred and ran into natives again. There were several casualties on both sides, but no outcome. Camping nearby, the U.S. troops were fired upon, killing several troops, including a lieutenant that was leading them. The battle was known as the Skirmish at Brennan's Prairie. So far, Kamiakin and the Central Washington Native tribes were on the defensive, but winning every battle. The Washington and Oregon territorial governments were unsure what to do next. A general by the name of John E. Wool arrived from California and stationed himself at Fort Vancouver. He wasn't very popular because he blamed much of the conflict that was occurring in the territories on the fault of the whites. His plan to move the Yakima and Pugent Sound Wars forward was to arm the militia in settlements close to hostile native areas and have the army stationed in areas natives were known to hunt. They would occupy traditional hunting grounds and fishing grounds, starving the Yakima into surrender. The governor down in the territory of Oregon had a different idea. Governor George Law Curry had taken a force of U.S. soldiers and decided to launch a preemptive and largely unprovoked attack against the eastern tribes of the Walla Walla, Palouse, Umatilla, and Cayuse, who had up until that point remained cautiously neutral in the conflict. The eastern tribes were now involved, causing the Walla Walla Valley to become yet another native hotspot. The Walla Walla leader Yellowbird responded by attacking Fort Walla Walla. In response, the Oregonian territory sent 350 soldiers to the abandoned fort and set out to punish the Walla Walla. Yellowbird, who believed it was an appropriate response to the attack on their reservation, met under the white flag of truce and offered himself up as a hostage to end hostilities and create a ceasefire. Other neighboring Cayuse and other tribes heard of the unprovoked attack on the Umatilla reservation and decided to take it a step further. A thousand warriors from the Cayuse, Palouse, and Walla Walla tribes descended down on the soldiers. The Battle of Walla Walla was the longest battle in Washington history. For four days, the eastern tribesmen battled the soldiers until the soldiers had run out of supplies and had to retreat. Yellowbird was later found beheaded, dismembered, and scalped as a result of the broken ceasefire. The governor of the territory of Washington, Governor Stevens, had just arrived from Washington, D.C. to a territory embroiled in chaos. Because Curry's unprovoked attack against the Umatilla Reservation had cut off much communication down the Oregon Trail, Stevens had to sneak his way across the Walla Walla Valley. He was furious he had to do so, and he blamed General Wool for it, while also chastising him for his current tactics against the natives. Both governors, Curry and Stevens, called for Wool's resignation. The winter slowed the conflict for a time, but it would only be another month before natives and whites would clash again.